What's up everybody and welcome back to another video on SAT Math from the Scalar Learning Channel. And this is a video that I'm so excited about because it's got so much important critical information. And I have talked about SAT math formulas in other videos, but this is an all-inclusive, all-encompassing SAT math formula video where I brought everything together that you need for success on the SAT. One quick thing to remember about this video is that there are certain area and volume formulas that I have not included, and that is because they are on the SAT formula sheet which is at the start of both the no calculator and calculator section so make sure you study this sheet to know what you don't need to know to know what you can just simply look up and reference on the day of without further ado let's do it the first formula is for calculating the slope of a line now of course your m represents the slope and the formula is y1 minus y2 over x1 minus x2 now here's an example of two points that are coordinates of a line and this is how you use the slope formula to calculate slope again we take the difference of the y values on the top and the difference of the x values on the bottom which ends up giving us a slope of one half next we have slope intercept form a very famous formula and this is of course y equals mx plus b in this formula m represents the slope and b represents the y intercept in this quick example of y equals 2x plus 7 we see that 2 is the slope and 7 is the y intercept and if we were to plot this out we see that 7 is where the line intercepts the y axis and of course the slope is 2 which means it has a rise of 2 and a run of 1. next we have point slope form point slope form is y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1 of course once again m represents the slope and x1 and y1 are any point on the line. So here's a quick example, y minus four equals three halves times x minus three. This of course means that on the graph, the point three, four is on the line. And of course this has a slope of three halves, which means there is a rise of three and a run of two. Next we have the midpoint formula, which calculates the middle of any line segment. The midpoint formula is x1 plus x2 divided by two comma y1 plus y2 divided by two. But essentially what you're doing here is you're taking the average of the two coordinates. And of course the two coordinates are x1, x2, y1, y2. Now taking these coordinates as examples, if we were to plug them in, it would look like this and the midpoint would be 7 comma 5.5. Next we have the distance formula and this is the formula that you're going to use to calculate the distance between any two points on a coordinate plane. With the distance formula, you see we're taking the difference of the two x values, squaring that and adding it to the square of the difference of the two y values. So if we have the two points 5, 3 and 1, 0, we can plug them into the distance formula like so. You'll know that 5 minus 1 squared is of course 16 and 3 minus 0 squared is of course 9. 16 plus 9 would give us 25 and the square root of 25 gives us a distance of Five. Next, we have the formula for the length of an arc of a circle. This formula is n over 360 times 2 pi r, where n is the central angle. And of course, 2 pi r, you'll notice, is the formula for the circumference of a circle. So if we look at a circle here, n is the central angle, and of course it's in degrees. That's why we have 360 on the denominator, and r is the radius. By the way, if this was in radians instead of degrees, you'd have n over 2 pi, as 2 pi radians equals 360 degrees. Next, we have the formula for the area of a sector. Here it is n over 360 times pi r squared, where once again, n is the central angle cutting out this sector. Here's an example. You'll see n is that central angle, and once again, r is the radius. This is in degrees, which is why 360 is below the n. And just to reiterate, if this was in radians, you could replace 360 with 2 pi. Next, we have the quadratic formula, which of course I have on my shirt. The quadratic formula is negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. This can be used to find the roots of a quadratic, meaning where this quadratic intercepts the x-axis. And if you're wondering where a, b, and c come from, they come from the standard form of a quadratic where a is the coefficient of the x squared, b is the coefficient of the x, and c is the constant. Next, we have SOHCAHTOA for trigonometry. Now, here's an example triangle. And again, SOHCAHTOA is all based around which angle you choose. So for these examples, we are choosing angle A highlighted in red. So stands for sine opposite over hypotenuse. So here we see that sine of angle A equals opposite angle A over the hypotenuse. Ka stands for cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. And again, that's relative to A. Last but not least, tangent is equal to opposite over adjacent. Next, we have the formula for probability. And probability is pretty straightforward. And it's simply the number of favorable outcomes over the total number of outcomes. So for example, if you have a bag of 10 marbles, three of them are red, the probability that you're gonna select 
The red marbles is three out of 10. Next, we have the circle equation. This is a super important formula. This always shows up in the SAT, and it is x minus h squared plus y minus k squared equals r squared. So if we look at a circle, we see that the center is h comma k, and of course the radius is r. So if we take this example here, the center would be at two negative five, and the radius would be the square root of 36, which is of course six. Next, we have the formula for exponential growth, and this also encompasses exponential decay as well. It is y equals a times one plus or minus r to the t power, where a represents the initial value, r represents the growth rate, and t represents time, which is usually years. So here's a quick example for exponential growth. We have an initial value of 200, a growth rate of 13% over a time span of three years. So when we plug everything into the formula, it looks like this. So notice that you have one plus 0.13, which means the percentage is going in in the decimal format. Next, let's look at exponential decay. Here we have an initial value of 150, a decay rate of 9% over a time span of two years. So when we're talking decay, it's all the same when we plug in the values, except now we're subtracting that percentage. So if this were simplified, what you'd see inside would be 0.91. Now we got the formula for the vertex of a parabola when the parabola is in standard form. So once again, here is standard form and the vertex can be found at negative B over 2A. And just to clarify, this will give you the X value of the vertex. If you want the Y value of the vertex, you have to take this value and plug it back into the quadratic. Next, we've got vertex form of a quadratic. This is a really cool form because you can look at it and immediately tell where the vertex is. So again, just for frame of reference, this would be the standard form of a quadratic, and here is vertex form, and note that the vertex is at h comma k. Next, we have one of the most famous formulas in math, the Pythagorean theorem, which is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Just to put it in context, here is a triangle, and note that a and b are the legs. They are the pieces that form the right angle, and of course, c is the hypotenuse, which is the longest side opposite the 90 degree angle. Next, we have distance equals rate times time. So D equals RT. It seems simple, but it's really useful when it comes to rate problems. Of course, D stands for distance, R stands for rate, and T stands for time. Just a quick note, when you're using this formula, you want to make sure that rate and time are using the same unit of time. For example, if rate is in miles per hour, T should be in hours as well. Next, there is an important relationship between sine and cosine that you've got to know to help you with some of the more complex trigonometry problems. And this formula is that sine of x equals cosine of 90 minus x. This is of course in degrees. What this is saying is that sine of an angle equals cosine of the complement of that angle. So for example, sine of 10 would equal cosine of 80, sine of 20 would equal cosine of 70, sine of 30, cosine of 60, and sine of 40 would equal cosine of 50. And of course there are more examples that you can look at, but just remember sine of an angle equals cosine of its complement. Next we've got the sum of solutions solutions for a quadratic. So if we have a quadratic in standard form set to zero and we're trying to find the sum of the solutions, it's simply negative b over a. Now, of course, you can find the solutions if you want and then add them together, but this is just a little shortcut. So for example, if we have zero equals two x squared plus seven x minus five, the sum of the solutions would be negative seven over two. Next, we have the discriminant for a quadratic and the formula is b squared minus four ac. You'll probably recognize this from the quadratic formula because it is the component that is under the square root in the quadratic formula. The discriminant is really helpful for gaining some insights about the solutions of a quadratic. So for this example, the discriminant is actually negative, which means that there are no real solutions. In this example, the discriminant is equal to zero, which means there is one real solution. Finally, in this example, the discriminant is greater than zero, which means there are two unique real solutions. Next, we have the formula for an equilateral triangle. So once again, an equilateral triangle is a triangle where all the sides are equal, all the angles are 60 degrees, and the formula is s squared times the square root of three divided by four. So in this example, where all the side lengths are one, the area of the triangle would be one times the square root of three over four. In this example, where all the side lengths are two, the area would be four times the square root of three over four, because of course four is two squared. And last but not least, when we have an equilateral triangle with side lengths of three, the area would be nine square root three over four. Next, we have Pythagorean triples. These are so helpful because they always use these on the SAT. And if you spot them, it'll save you some time from using Pythagorean's theorem. The most the most famous one is of course three, four, five, and there's an example of a three, four, five right triangle where five is the hypotenuse. We also have five, 12, 13, seven, 24, 25,
25 and 8, 15, 17. So again, these are the most common ones that usually show up on the SAT. But be aware that you'll also see multiples of these Pythagorean triples. So for example, here are the different possibilities for larger three, four, five triangles. This is for 5, 12, 13, more for 7, 24, 25, and finally more for 8, 15, and 17 triangles. Next is the formula to calculate perpendicular slope, and it's not really a complicated formula, but it's something that you need to know. So for example, if we have a line with a slope of A over B, the perpendicular slope would be the negative reciprocal, which would be negative B over A. So for example, we have a line here that has a slope of two thirds. The perpendicular slope would be negative three over two. And just FYI, the Y intercepts are irrelevant to whether or not the lines are perpendicular. Finally, we have the formula for the sum of interior angles of a polygon. The formula is the sum equals N minus two times 180. And this is of course in degrees. N represents the number of sides of the polygon. So for example, for a triangle, you would plug in three and you would get 180. For a quadrilateral, you would plug in four and get 360. And for a pentagon, you would plug in five and get 540. Watch this video multiple times. Commit these to memory. Print these out if you have to. These formulas are so important and will help you so much on your path to SAT victory. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. And if you did, please click that like button. And if you want to see more from the Scalar Learning Channel, make sure to click subscribe. Thank you guys so much for joining and I'll see you in the next video. Take it easy.